Hello, good morning, my name is SBJ. Welcome to this fourth part in our How to Paint series. If you haven't seen any of the previous videos, that's absolutely fine because you can do this on ready to run models or models that you've already painted yourself. But this is my favorite part. We are gonna be covering weathering today. Now, if you would like to see how we've done some of the color swatches from the previous videos, I'm gonna put a little link in the card up there and you'll be able to have a look at how we did that. We've also covered doing transfers and some of the beginning steps of the actual project. So what we're gonna be doing in today's video is weathering in three different ways, easy, medium, and hard, or from a different perspective, possibly a time-saving way, a no airbrush way, and then the more authentic way. It's down to debate on how you want to do this. Me personally, when I'm doing models, I'm very lazy. <laughs> very very lazy when I have to be or when I can be I should say and for that the airbrush is the the middle tier and the only reason it's in the middle tier is because you need the airbrush to be able to do it if it was something that everybody had I'd probably put it in the easier tier so the first option is we're going to be doing the easy method where you can do this with a brush and just straight up acrylic paints that you can buy in a games workshop warhammer shop or any hobby supply shop that sells those kinds of paints the second method that we're going to be doing is using an airbrush where we're going to be adding dirt and grime by simply airbrushing on. It's the quickest method out of the whole thing. And then finally, third, we are going to be using oil paints and white spirit to create the weathering and the grime that we've been hoping to get this entire time. Now, what I would tend to do if I was doing this for my own stuff on the layout or stuff that I was painting tank wise or even infantry for Warhammer. I would personally do this in a way that I would do the oil paint first, do all the streaking and the griming, let it dry out, let it air out, give it at least a couple of days before I move on to the next section. Uh, and that allows the white spirit to evaporate and make it so touching the other paints isn't gonna be as much of a problem. However, still wear gloves when you're doing it. Now, you can add a layer of matte varnish in between. That is completely up to you, me personally. I like to live life dangerously and I don't add a level of matte varnish to it. But what I do after the white spirits and everything's evaporated is I then go over it with the airbrush to sort of get some of the dustier effects on there. Um, now the white spirit and the oil paints do a lot of the work, especially on trains and locos and things like that. Uh, but the airbrush adds that sort of, as I say, almost like a dusty sort of feeling and it's really good for creating that smoke dirt, grime that comes off of like exhausts and it's also very good for the dust and stuff that you get that sort of comes off the ground. So let's go and have a look at all of the pieces of kit. We're going to go through all of these bits and I'll see you at the end of the video. Right so let's talk about what we're going to be doing with all of these pieces. Now you've seen the finished product but let's have a look at how we're going to get these to those products that you've already seen. So this wagon part is going to be done with all of the methods I'm going to be showing you. These three, sorry, these three are going to be done with the airbrush. These three are going to be done with oil paints. And these two are going to be done with the Games Workshop paint method. So this method is going to be first up and this one is going to be the one that you can do with a paint and paintbrush you do not need an airbrush for this as i've said i'm going to be combining all of them onto this one wagon so that you can see what they all look like together but they all work individually me personally i think that this is the easiest one to do without having to get an airbrush this one is the easiest in terms of how quickly you can do it but it doesn't necessarily give you the complete finish that you're after and this one gives you a much more, what's the best way? I think this one gives you the more authentic look, but it does take a longer amount of time to do it. Obviously, I think that when you put all of them together, it looks great as well. So we've got our beginners, medium, hard. Not even hard. Beginners, medium, something. Some beginner, <laughs> heavy weathering. Let's go for that. Cool, so let's get started. I'm going to be working on using just paints and a brush. Okay, so for this beginner's method that involves no airbrush, all you need is you need your surfaces. These have been primed with a matte varnish so that they're not as glossy as the other pieces. 
you need some sort of mixing tray or palette. I'll be honest, recently I've decided that collecting milk lids is just as easy as having a particular palette. Um, you can recycle them, reuse them, you can throw them away, but whatever your choice <laughs> is to do. And we only need two paints for this. Now we're gonna be using Mournfang Brown, which is a Citadel base paint, and Riser Rust, which is a dry paint. Now, we're not gonna be using Riser Rust like a dry paint. We're gonna be using it in a very different way. So, we don't need to go with Riser Rust just yet. We're gonna be starting with Mournfang Brown. Now, me personally, I feel that this resembles an anime paint style. Now, make sure that you've shaken your paints. This hasn't been used in a while, so I had to make sure I shook that one up. And the reason it sort of looks a bit anime is because the colours are actual colours. They're not oils that are sort of a bit translucent or anything like that. They are literally actual paints. However, we're almost going to be creating them to be like a wash. So all I'm doing here is I'm putting Mornfang Brown in with water and water and water. And you can make it as thick or as thin as you like. The reason I'm using the particular uh, color palettes that I'm using, or the color swatches that I'm using, is because these are darker colors. And the oil washes won't necessarily show up on them. And depending on the uh, airbrushing you do, it might not show up either. But also, I don't know if you remember in the episode where we did the Iron Warriors, I said that I think that this will look a lot better once you start weathering and making it grimy and stuff like that. So, you use a brush that suits you. Me personally, I'm using a Rosemary & Co. number 2 on this. Um, I've seen people use finer brushes, I've seen people use thicker brushes. So, what I'm going to do, let's move the palettes on this side because I am a cat candid. Cool. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to have a look at all of the areas where grime and muck is likely to build up. When I put it on there, it will become evident whether I need to thin the paint more or add more paint to it. And I think personally, oh no, actually, that's all right. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to show up. And all I'm gonna be doing over this is I am gonna be going over all the rivets, all of the cracks, crevices. You can do as little or as much as you want on this section and you can go as heavy as you want. So I want this to be quite dirty and grimy. So what I'm doing is I'm just, as I say, I'm using it like a wash, uh, almost like when you see people doing brickwork in model trains or with scenery and they're putting washes on metallics. This is exactly the same thing. And all I'm doing is I'm just putting the wash and all of these rivets. And in some cases, I'm also making sure that I just do a little bit of a, a stroke downwards with it because you do that you're going to start creating that sort of grime dripping down thing and when you have things like this white skull on here you're going to start seeing that grime accumulate which is good now me personally when i'm doing this when i'm doing the brown that is my preference to be the heavier color if i'm going everywhere i'm doing it with the brown you don't have to do every rivet either i'm going to because that's just me I like things very grimy and all I'm doing is I'm just whereas you sometimes when you've got your cracks crevices and stuff and you put a wash on there you're using it to sort of create automatic shade on there with this we're almost making it pop a little bit more and I'm just putting that all over here and I'm just going over the top now because on this particular piece, I have already done typhus corrosion on the tank wheels and stuff like that. So that's technically also cut out a little bit of work for me. But if you go too heavy around the wheels and the exhaust with this, you when you then put on your typhus corrosion at the correct stage, you'll uh, get the look that you're going for. Now, because you've watered this down as well, and depending on your consistency that you've done it with, you can drag it around to make it so that it's not completely in all of your cracks and crevices. As I say, I'm a big fan of this method, especially when I'm doing Warhammer Horus Heresy or any sort of tanks like that. I find it a very easy and therapeutic method. You're just sort of cutting down the amount of work that you're doing. And what I am doing is I'm pulling this paint down 
every chance I get. And the reason for that is because the rust is obviously going to be going down. If you think you've done too much, you just add a little bit of water to your paintbrush and you can go over it again. And you're going to see that that skull is going to look really obvious now because you've got a lot of dirt to contrast with it. So I'll be back in a second. I'm going to do all of this with the brown and we'll be back. So there we are, we have done all of the brown on this. And me personally, I've gone very heavy on this. You don't have to go in every crack and crevice. There's certain lines I haven't gone to, like this bit up here, I didn't touch, or at least it hasn't stayed on there with the paint. Now, one of the beauties of doing it this way is that because you're using an acrylic paint that is heavily watered down, you can brush stuff off if you want. You will have seen on the last part of that video as well, I watered down the brown a little bit more and all I did was I just touch my brush up against the bottom of there and that's to create more dirt, scratches and muddle and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do is going to let that dry. I'm going to work on the other two off camera uh, and then we're going to come back and have a look at doing the riser rust on there to complete this particular method. Okay, so I've finished doing all three of these with the Mornfang Brown. Ta -da. Uh, and what I've done is this one was very much middle of the road. Uh, I did this one quickly, I watered it down to a certain degree, but not too much, uh, and this is the sort of the finished product. I'm happy with it because it sort of, it helps break up some of those metallic colours, because where we've done sort of shading across the board, come on, where we've done that shading on there, what happens is, when you add these extra colours, it starts to help break it up and you can see the differences. So I can see personally, there's a lot of bronzy bits down at the bottom here from shading. And then in these open bits here, where we've done the shading, it pops a lot more. Now, when I was looking at it previously, it all sort of blended into one, which was weird because I spent a long time trying to sort of do it. So we've put the Mornfang Brown on here. On this one, the wagon, and you can see that some of it's still not dry. That's because on this one in particular, I watered it down quite a bit. Now, the reason for that is because we're going to be putting a lot of different things on here, because as you remember, this is the one where we are adding various things. And what I'm actually going to do is there's still pools of bits of brown around here that haven't dried. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to mop them up. And what this does is because I've watered it down more, you can't necessarily see it at this stage, but it's going to provide a nice undertone when we start adding more things on top. And all it does really is at the moment, because we've watered it down so much, is apart from this bit here where there's a lot of cracks, crevices that it's sort of sticking into, it almost creates more of a brown hue on there, which hopefully when everything comes together will look great. And because we're using more sort of I'd say aggressive colours whilst doing this. Hopefully you'll be able to see those with the other types of weathering when it comes along. So the one I spent the most amount of time on, which I'm surprised at because I was just going to sort of try and speed through this. And this is the black one. And this is one of the ones that whenever I tried to photograph it, I couldn't get a good picture of it. But for me now, what I can see on the camera what I can see in real life, I can see the blue hues and the like the, the incubi darkness that I put in there to sort of create those different tones. So it's not just black with a little bit of gray. There is a sort of a blue hue in there, which bluey greeny hue, and I'm really, really liking it. So much so that it was it gives me that sort of, oh, I'm glad I did the colors I did. And the only thing that I've done is I've just added an additional color that's nothing like the original colors on there. And it's just sort of helped bring out those parts. Now this one, I did a real mix of the same technique that I've been doing. But what I did was I've sort of, I've gone quite thick with the brown in some areas and really thin in others. And I've gone back over it in certain areas. Um, and when we start applying the orange on there, hopefully that'll make it pop more. So I'm going to give these a little bit of time to dry and then we're going to come back and do the riser rust on them. I've given it a little bit of time to dry. Let's have a look at attacking these. So we're going to be using Citadel Dry Riser Rust. Now this is a dry brush paint, which if you've ever done dry brushing before, basically means that you are supposed to put in a brush that is dry, rub a little bit of the excess off on a paper towel and 
probably use a new palette if I'm really honest. Dry the excess off on a paper towel and then sort of go at it and use your dry brush and sort of you pick up the highlights and the edges on things. And that works. It, it's a fantastic paint for that. However, it's also a fantastic paint for helping bits of grime, dirt and things like that popping in there. And I think it's because it's got such a high pigment amount in there. I don't know. I don't know the proper science behind it. Oh, whoops. Bit of mess. I don't know the proper science behind it all, but this paint just does the job. It's really good for this. I wouldn't use it in the airbrush, but when I'm doing things like weathering with a paintbrush, it's perfect. So the main thing with using the orange here is once again, you water it to whatever level you want to water it. But you should really, and once again, you do what you want. You're here because you want tips and tricks, but at the end of the day, you are your own person. I hope you're your own person and that you almost want to go over exactly the same areas that you did with the brown, but not as much of it. So for example, I went all around this outside bit, but all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this bottom corner, and I think that needs to be a little bit thicker. And because it's a dry paint, I'm not putting my nice Rosemary & Co brush in there because I don't want to dam damage it. I'm not saying that you will, I'm just instead using my old wash brush, which is so old that I snapped it and had to tie, tie. I had to put a bit of Black Nasty around the outside. So we're just using this orange on here. As I say, we don't want to go past the areas we've already done. We kind of just want to accentuate them. And this means that you don't necessarily have to do every rivet. You don't necessarily have to do every crack and crevice because then you've got some brown, some orange, uh, some that are sort of halfway between because you're watering the paint down a little bit more. But this one also, the more you water it down, becomes a little bit more opaque. So you can sort of get a weird translucent look to it. Now I'm just going to do, I tend to find the further down on a model towards the ground that you are. I think personally there's more grime, more dirt, more dust and you sort of want to do that. So I'm doing all of the rivets along the bottom and this little step bit here, I'm putting quite a lot under there. I'm just putting that on there and all this orange is doing is once again, like we did before, let's put a little blob up there. It's just creating more accents around things that we've already done, helping things pop helping them go puzzow to hopefully make our models interesting. Now, I'll be honest, I've not tried this on any model railway stuff before. This is something I tend to have kept for war games, Warhammer, uh, Horus Heresy and stuff like that. But, that's why you couldn't, like, there's nothing if the police want to come after you because you've been using Warhammer paints and techniques on uh, your tanks then there's something seriously wrong once again if you don't like it you don't have to do it likewise if someone else likes it and you don't you can just walk on by you don't have to tell them that they're doing it wrong you do whatever you feels best and as I say I like this because this is a technique I learned way before I got my airbrush and it's a technique that's stuck with me for such a long time because it's so fun and easy. And where I paint my necromunda stuff in high contrast sort of methods, I really like using this because it also provides high contrast. So I have these big bright creatures with high contrast armor. And then I use the oranges and the browns to accentuate that. Now, admittedly, one of my gangs in Necromunda uses red. And it doesn't necessarily work well with that, hence why you're not seeing the red tank here. Cool. I think, maybe a little spot there, I'm gonna water this down a little bit more. I'm gonna put a spot there, a spot there. The thing is, if you put these spots in and really water them down, 
they'll dry eventually but they won't look like big blobs they'll have sort of worked themselves out and you get these nice opaque type bits on there I'm just going to do a little bit more up here so usually you would have the doors on these tanks and you wouldn't necessarily see all these bits but if you do this and paint this before you put the door on you're creating that same thing of the water and the rust and the grime is still going to get in the latches of the door they're not airtight at least i don't think they are and yeah i, lo I love doing this method it's so therapeutic when you've got like a whole section of tanks or infantry that need all of this doing it does make your life a little bit more fun because you don't have to have a particular method and because you're being random you don't want to go OTT with it and if you think you've done a little bit too much you can just use your brush and tease areas so that they're not as covered as they were and what I have done is in the corners on these black bits I'm putting the orange as well and looking at bits like this it looks like it's going to turn into this big orange blobby mess but actually when it dries it just creates that same dirty look it's just a more watered down version that's gone into the recesses cool i'm happy with that what you could do is you could do the same thing along these tank tracks here um, but yeah i've done all the rivets and I'm just gonna you always find this you always see oh i could put a little bit there i don't want to do too much here but because i know it's on a part where there's going to be lots of water catching i'm just going to do a little bit there so there it goes in cool that's our iron warriors one done we're going to move on to this one and i'll be back with you guys in a sec okay so we're back let's have a look at how we're currently looking now these are done in terms of this technique they still need to dry a little bit because i've obviously watered down a lot of the orange so it still needs a little bit of time to dry but I'm really happy with how this has come out you can see where the orange isn't necessarily where all the brown is and that helps it pop a little bit more likewise the brown being by itself also creates that nice little pop now these will be dry by the time we get to the end of the video and you get to see all of these little bits in here but hopefully this has given you the urge that if you don't have an airbrush or you want to just sit and paint without having to use an airbrush you can do this or if you want to add it in you can now the black one I watered this down a lot more on here because obviously the brown was showing up a lot more so there's not as much orange on here as it looks once it dries hopefully we'll get a nice little look on that and um, I've tried to put a lot of detail not detail I've tried to put a lot of weathering up here to sort of try and almost try and get rid of that transfer that it's been rusted away and stuff like that um, what we can do on here later is we can do some sponge chipping or things like that to try and make the areas that are really bright sort of toned down we'll look into that that's why i prefer the airbrush for because i like sort of taking the shine off some of the nice transfers now this one as i said i'm really happy with how this one has turned out simply because it's made the actual base color look really nice in my eyes so yeah now this one is still drying because i once again watered it down a lot i've only put the riser rust on certain areas and i'm hoping that this dries quite nicely because as i say we're going to be putting a lot of things over the top of this so in the next stage we're going to be looking at airbrushing so i'm going to get all of my airbrush kit ready and we're going to have a look at trying to weather some of the other tank pieces i'll see you soon okay so now we're going to be moving on to the airbrushing so if you've watched the previous video about how to panel highlight you'll have a rough idea of how we're going to be doing this however just to sort of cover it again the paints that we're going to be using so these have all been given a coat of gloss varnish these haven't been matte varnished like some of the other pieces we're going to be using airbrush thinner airbrush flow improver all by vallejo uh, and then we're going to be using vallejo model air black vallejo model air burnt umber model color dark sand and model air middle stone these are my personal preferences. I tend to do quite sandy colours when I'm doing weathering. If you want to keep it to darker muds or weird sort of ash wastes or Mars pattern type things, you can sort of mix the colours in and put some reds and oranges in if you so like. We'll be using the airbrush as normal. I'm going to leave a little 
card up above so that if you want to go to the airbrushing video, you can, so you can learn how to do airbrushing like that. But because I'm gonna be wearing my mask, I won't be able to talk you through this, so we're just gonna be going through. So what I'm gonna do, I never used to do this, I'm actually gonna start off doing the burnt umber first. Usually I would work from darkest to lightest, not in this instance. We are gonna be working with burnt umber first, then we're gonna be going to black, then middle stone, and then dark sand. What we'll do is we will try and work around the areas where there's gonna be dirt, dust, and grime. And then when we come in with the black, we won't be covering as much of an area. Now, as I say, I used to do this the other way around, but I found that having the black on top of the burnt umber looks better, personally. So we're gonna be doing it all around sort of the bottoms of the tanks and things like that, and put it in places where you might expect it to be. Uh, and then using the, these two will be covered sort of pretty much over the tank in various areas, whereas these will be quite stuck towards the bottom because we don't want all the sandy colors coming up through all the hard work that we've already done. So I'm gonna put my mask on, we're gonna start airbrushing and you can follow along. Okay, so we have finished airbrushing all of these. Now, I went heavy on the sand on this one because it contrasts really nicely with the red. I went and didn't go as much sand on this one because it's already white, it's already a light color. We don't need that to sort of blast it out. So I've kept a lot of the darker colors on here. This one I sort of went middle of the road um, and you can see where I've done the black around the, I always think these are exhausts. I don't know if they are for certain, but they always look like exhausts to me. Um, and then what we'll do is eventually we'll paint these top parts so that they don't, they're not bright white. I found this step actually extremely difficult doing the wagon, um, mainly because I know that it's gonna be really dirty and I'm about to cover it in oils. So maybe that was an oversight on my part. In When I weather locos, I usually do oil paints then airbrushing, because it sort of almost seals it in to a certain degree. So maybe that's where I've gotten wrong on this sort of method, but these are done. We're gonna put them in the pile with the other method that we've done with the paints and using a paintbrush. And we're gonna come back and we are going to do oil paints. I'll see you in a sec. Okay, so for the final three, we're going to be doing the Oil paints. Now this method is a fun method in my eyes because you get to get really messy and then you sort of strip it all back. So you can go as heavy or as light as you want with this. Now me, by now if you haven't figured it out, I'm a sucker for going really heavy on weathering. Uh, so we're gonna be doing it on the yellow, the green, and the uh, the sort of the greeny blue of the Sons of Horus. And we're also gonna be doing it on our wagon here. So. Let's get our oil paints and everything out and we'll talk about what kit we're using. So working on these tank sides, we are gonna be using the Winsor & Newton Winton Oil Color set. We've got raw umber for our darkest color, we've got burnt umber for our middle tone if we want it, and we've got burnt sienna as well. And what we tend to do with these is we just plaster on wherever you think and they mix, they cause fantastic little shades that they do and you don't necessarily have to be careful because you're gonna be stripping it back. Now, once we've put these paints on, I already have pre-mixed versions of these where I have the colours mixed in with uh, Windsor & Newton White Spirit, Artist White Spirit. Now the reason I use the Artist White Spirit is because it doesn't give you such a headache. Um, I also have another one here that's using the uh, Burnt Sienna in there. And you can apply this in those washes and you make it as thick or as thin as you like. Um, what I tend to do is using my milk lid. I tend to put a bit of this pre-mixed in and then I add a little bit of the colors around the pot so I can sort of go in. The reason I don't paint straight on uh, with the particular oils myself is because I like that the white spirit helps it evaporate so it becomes a little bit easier to touch further down the line. However, I do strongly recommend that you do wear gloves doing this because the last thing you want is to do some brilliant weathering and then get your fingerprints or thumbprints all over your nice model. 
Now, sneakily, I've picked colours that aren't necessarily reds, oranges, or uh, sort of dark colours because these will show up a little bit better with that. Uh, the argument could be that I could have gone with uh, the white in this so that you really get to see all of the different colours, but I also wanted to go with the airbrush so you could see how we attack those really bright colours as well. So, I'm going to get my old scabby brushes and I'm just going to cake this on here and I'll show you on all three of them how I'm doing that. So, let's crack on. Also, before I get started on this, I do want to clarify that I'm also using this uh, old Citadel painting mat and it's basically become my oil painting mat because I just get stuff over it, let it dry out using with the white spirits in there and then sort of just chuck it away. It, it's a great painting mat because it's a non-slip but I don't have the space to have it out all the time so I tend to just sort of put it away when I need to. So let's get started on some colours. So what I did in that process was I, I slathered on the oils, I made sure that I got the mix that I was looking for, uh, enough that the white spirit was mixing somehow with the paints, and then what I started to do was just brush down and try and get rid of some of the excess that I don't need. And because I'm using the white spirit, hopefully this will evaporate soon. So I'm going to leave it for an hour or two and then I'm going to come back to it and what I'm going to start doing is start attacking it and try and get it that we start get that nice weathering look. The longer you leave it, the more stubborn the dirt or the grime becomes or the oil paints become. And that's something that I really want to leave is that sort of grimy streak on there. So I'll come back in a couple of hours and get this all tidied up. Okay, so a little bit of time has passed. Um, one of these has basically dried to the touch. Uh, one of them is almost dry and one of them is uh, still sort of wet, but they're, they're workable. And off camera, I also did the wagon. I forgot to do that on camera for you. So. The tools that I'm going to be using for this, I don't need any white spirit, but I might have some on standby just in case. However, I'm going to be using a cotton bud, a recyclable one, uh, with a cardboard shaft, cardboard handle. Uh, the washed or the rinsed in white spirit version of the brush I was already using, and two of ones. The reason for this, oh, and lots of kitchen roll. That will come into play in a bit. The reason I use different brushes is because they get wet sometimes very quickly. And to do this, you sort of need the brushes to be dry. So whilst using the kitchen roll to dry them out, sometimes it makes sense to just switch between brushes as and when you need to. So I have a couple of sheets at the ready. I also like to use the kitchen roll to just sort of smear away at some of the bits. So for example, if I do this, uh, let's do it on this wagon. I don't want to ruin anything just yet, just in case. So what I'm gonna do, just use the end of the kitchen roll and just drag down. Now when there's a lot of areas for it to catch on, it doesn't do so well. But what this does do is it cleans up a lot of the stuff that you don't need that you'll just end up wiping and wiping with the brushes and it will take forever. So I quite like using this because it almost dries the bits out that you don't need to. And you're still catching all the oil paints in the gaps. So I'm just gonna go around with it now. When there's lots of catches on there it's not so great. When you've got sort of smooth sides of locomotives or um, coaches and stuff it's perfect. But this one's got a little bit of an area to catch on but it's okay. We can, we can keep doing that. It just shows you that you can do it as well. Now this is going to be very brown looking at the moment but the more and more we work away at it the more grime we remove the more we're going to go back to that grey colour, not necessarily all the way to the grey colour. Uh, seeing as we've started on it, let's work on this one. So I'm going to speed it up and I'm going to work away at these with a mixture of cotton bud or q-tip if you're from the US and various brushes. Okay, I'm just trying this without the light to see if it makes a big difference to it. However, on the tanks that went as perfect as I needed it to go. Uh, I used 
the kitchen roll to get the majority of the dirt and grime off. Um, and then I used brushes, cotton buds, to sort of work away at it, which you would have seen. Now with the wagon, I don't know if it's because I've been putting stuff on it so far all day and I've basically created a, a layer of film using the airbrush, but basically all the stuff I'd done today pretty much came off. <laughs> so that's a lesson for me. So what I did was I went back over it, as you will have seen, uh, and redid the oils on it. And instead of waiting for it to dry, I just used a dry brush and I just wiped it down. So it's lost pretty much all of the airbrush grime on there bar a few bits, but it now has the grime from the oil paints on there instead. So I'm happy in the sense that it still looks dirty and grimy and we can get that put onto the wagon base and we can get that sent off. Uh, but I'm really happy with how the tank parts came out. So let's turn the light on, see if we can. There we go, right. So yeah, so there's the Sons of Horus type color. Uh, this was quick, doing all the tank bits. This was not a problem whatsoever. I was able to just brush these down and get the level of grime that I wanted. If you wanted more grime on this, you wait a little bit longer for it to dry, uh, use less white spirit, and you just need to make sure that you're always doing downstrokes with it. The second that you start doing opposite directions is when you start mucking up the, all the hard work you've done. Uh, the yellow one also came out lovely. Uh, that one I've gone quite heavy on with the grime um, to the point where some of the browns and the yellows blending quite nicely with each other and once again you could leave it some nice streaking up this end here it's coming up really bright on the camera but in real life it's actually fine it's really good uh, it's also toned down all of the transfers which is what i wanted uh, this green one also did fantastic work for me uh, i found for some reason this one was a lot easier to do with the cotton bud uh, but that's not a problem i'm really happy with how these ones have turned out so, I'm going to get all of the bits back together and we can have a look at the finished project of everything that we've done. Okay, so here we are. We have got all of the finished products. Hopefully, during this entire project, and it's been a long project, uh, you will have picked up some hints and tips along the way that you've enjoyed. So, let's just have a quick look at everything that we've done today. So, we've got here our uh, using acrylic base paints with a paintbrush to create the weathering effect using the streak and the grime. Uh, the ones on the left we have the airbrush ones, harder to do if you don't have an airbrush but they certainly uh, make the job get done very quickly. Uh, and then thirdly we've got the oil paints the uh, with white spirit to create the streak and the grime. Now I'll try and put some pictures up on the screen of all these individual ones so you can have a look. Me personally I think that the easiest one to do is the airbrush one because you can do it in five minutes. Once you've got your airbrush set up and everything ready to go you'll you'll be laughing. This one's certainly easier if you don't have an airbrush. Uh, this one is definitely more technical to a certain degree. It creates a lot more mess and you have to be prepared to get it done. Uh, you kind of can't leave it for too long because otherwise the uh, it becomes harder and harder to get the grime and the streaks off. So, yeah. So there we have it. We have finished this mammoth project. Uh, I cannot thank everyone enough who's been following the project on Instagram. When I uploaded the pictures of the final finished weathering, I got such a good response on it. And it sort of accidentally timed out that I managed to do this around the same sort of time of the release of the new version 2.0 Horus Heresy. So, thank you. Like... It was a complete accident, but I just want to thank everybody who shared the post uh, and got everyone excited for it. It got me excited, and all of the colours that I've done here have been possible legions that I've wanted to have a look at doing in the Horus Heresy 2.0. If you don't know what the Horus Heresy 2.0 is, it is my previous life before I started doing trains on YouTube. Um, there are battle reports and videos that I did from years and years ago uh, that include all of that in there. Uh, so if you're watching this and you are getting into the Horus Heresy, Please let me know what legion you're doing down below. I'm really interested to see what people are doing. And if you're using the colour palettes that we've shown in this series, then once again, let me know. For my own self-ego, obviously. Um, if you're using this on trains and locos and rolling stock and buildings and stuff like that, also 
Let me know what you're using it on and what your favorite technique has been. Let me know if you are one of the airbrush weathering, if you are one of the oil paint weatherings, or you are the acrylic and paintbrush weathering. No, no answer is wrong, but I like to know what people are up to. Um, coming, coming soon, we're gonna be doing a little video on this thing in the background. Uh, which is an exhibition now that I'm going to be building. Um, alternatively, if you want to watch other videos from this particular series, you can find them here and here. Uh, and if you have any questions or anything for me, please leave a comment down below. I love to get in touch with people and I'm always intrigued as to what people would like to see coming up soon. That's it for now. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy your weekend if you're watching this at the weekend. If you are watching it any other time. Enjoy your day anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment down below. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you guys soon. Thanks. I've been SBJ.